learn. All right, so thank you all for attending this learning beyond the classroom conversation today. Uh, my name is Danielle McGee. I am the library director and the archivist here at Houston Phillips University. And our program title today is Celebrate afro Latinidad and Panamanian Roots at HT. Um, after meeting Javier Wallace, who came to visit the university archives for research related to Panamanian athletes, I thought that he would be the perfect person to have a conversation with as we started this month to recognize this Planet Heritage Month and what it means in relationship to Houston Phillips and University as a historical Black college and now university. Um, we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month from September 15th to October 15th, and it is intended to celebrate Latinx folks and their culture. And there's so much diversity that we wanted to have a conversation about Afro-Latino culture and what that looks like, and also to explore what that looks like with um, the university's international roots, and in particular with uh, the Panamanian um, culture and athletes that Javier researches. And um, Javier's bio, it is a bit lengthy, but we will read through it and, <laughs> and go from there. <laughs> um, Javier Wallace is currently a PhD student at the University of Texas at Austin. He researches issues surrounding race, class, gender, labor, labor migration, nationality, transnationalism of athletes from the U.S., Latin America, and the Caribbean. Javier's dissertation, Sueños del Norte, Afro-Panamanian Hoop Dreams and Realities of Basketball Trafficking, was selected as a topic on Afro-Latin studies for the Master Mamlian Clark Dissertation Workshop, part of the Afro-Latin American Research Institute at the Hutchins Center at Harvard University. Javier's work and research has been supported by fellowships and grants, including the Joe Arbina Latin American Sports History Grant at UT Austin's Curriculum and Instruction Graduate Fellowship, well, fellowship and the Latinx Project at New York University. Javier earned his bachelor's and master's degree from Florida A&M University, where he played offensive lineman for the Rattler football team. He is of U.S. and Panamanian heritage and has served as athletic director and physical educator in the Republic of Panama. Javier is an avid world traveler and co-founder of two uh, social entrepreneurial projects, Afro-Latino Travel and Black Austin Tours. And so today we will have a um, conversation again about about um, Javier's Panamanian roots and his study around athletes. And he'll start with a presentation and then we'll kind of have uh, more conversation and questions around um, more of his studies in about um, Afro-Latino culture and what that means in its terms. You know, this is something that I'm still learning, something that in terms of um, terms that are politically correct to use, terms that aren't politically correct to use. There's so many changes. And so uh, as a librarian, I think it's very important that um, I continue to do lifelong learning and learn um, as I share that um, sentiment with all the, the students in our um, participants from our, our neighbor community, uh, not community library, but our neighboring uh, university. So without further ado, Javier Wallace. Uh, thank you, Danielle. Thank you. And before I begin, I definitely want to give a huge shout out and thanks to you, Danielle. And Danielle is definitely an individual that everybody on this call needs to know and needs to tell somebody about. The work that she's doing over at HT is beyond amazing um, with the library, with the archives, um, in ways that I don't experience in other places in Austin, particularly on UT's campus because we're not a campus that's centered around blackness um, in the African diaspora as Houston Tillerson is in particular the library and the archives at HT. So I'm grateful for this opportunity because it's Danielle who literally has unlocked the door 
uh, phys in physical sense, going into the archives and in a more general sense of allowing this research to take place. And then I think it's so important that we recognize you and the work that you do and what it means to the larger community here in Austin um, and around the state and what we're gonna talk about today around the world because these things that happened on Houston Tillerson's campus since this inception has impacted the globe in ways that we don't know. And um, what ways that we know, but not, not enough people know about beyond certain people. So thank you. And I'll go ahead and share my screen y'all and I'll get started. Um, and, and I'm gonna try my best to stay within time. No, I'll try. Y'all probably seeing the whole inside of my life. Just let you know how many things I have always going on at once with all the tabs, don't be surprised, it's normal. Uh, so I talked to y'all about 15 minutes today and then I'll move into our whole conversation. But it's so important for me to start here um, because I feel like I am a legacy of Houston Tillerson University. Even though I didn't attend Houston Tillerson University, it's one of the places that I believe gave me life. Um, because if it's not the opportunity that's presented to my father to follow in the footsteps of many Panamanians, Black Panamanians like himself, I don't think I would be here today. Um, I have been an adjunct professor at Houston Tillerson University. The majority of the time I spent as a youth, if I had to compare between two campuses that both of my parents went to, my mother went to the University of Texas at Austin, and my father went to Houston Tillerson, I spent more time in my youth going to Houston Tillerson in events at HT than I ever did at, the universe, at UT, even though I grew up here. Um, I attended Florida a and University, another HBCU. I was a student athlete, played football, and I think that just, it really ties well into what I wanna address today with everybody um, and how I came into this. Because like I said, Houston Tillerson is, it, 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 for me, it's, it's the center of who I am in many ways, not the only way, but in many ways, because I remember when, I, when you look at this picture, it reminds me of why I've always thought about Houston Tillerson HT, because this is the 1977-1978 tennis team. And this is my father, Ernesto Wallace. This is Carlos Gill. This is Carlos Aguilar, Carlos Gill and Victor Wallace. That's my uncle. That's my, bro my dad's brother. And all of these men all come from Panama. This entire tennis team at Houston Tillerson was composed of Panamanians. And his sister was also there playing basketball and on the women's, tennis, and the win women's tennis team. So I always had this question of like, how did this happen? How did all these Panamanians, but black Panamanians get to Austin to play tennis? And I never really thought deeply about it. I always knew that it existed because it was a part of my history. But it, it wasn't until last, last summer, I was on a grant in Panama doing research about Latin American sport history that I came randomly, came across an article in the Panama Tribune, which was a, a black English newspaper in Panama at the time. And it was an article from, like you see, July 10th, 1955. And I don't even know why my eyes drew me to this. I was like not even... I'm searching through the sports section. This is not even in the sports section. And I'm just, whatever, just reading. And I'm like, Cyril Pyle, he came and it's like, you can maybe see here that Cyril Pyle came to Tillerson Institute to finish his high school in Austin in 1942. And I'm like, what in the world is going on here? Oh, wait, I knew my dad came to Panama from Panama in 74. Well, how you mean to tell me that in 1942? There was already a Panamanians coming to Houston, coming to Austin to seek higher education. And of course, you know, well, you might not know in Panama, education only went to the eighth grade for a long period of time. And especially for black people, eighth grade was the highest grade that you could go to within the country. So if you wanted to get education beyond the eighth grade, you really needed to leave. Um, not too many people left because the options were different at that time, but Cyril Pyle, and that, and that really got me asking like, man, what was going on in Austin? And how did these Panamanians get to know about Austin, Texas in the deep South? 
because usually when we think about black Latinos or Afro Latinos, whatever we want to say, you know, we think about New York, like the, all these Puerto Ricans. And it's not too often that Austin, Texas or the deep South comes into our mind. So this really pushed me to find out more. And Cyril Powell, um, he actually was a classmate and friend of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, you can Google him if you want more information, but I'm still looking for a lot more information about this, about this gentleman who came to Tillotson before, before the two institutions merged. So those are a lot of questions that I had, and it really sent me to look and find out what was going on and what could have possibly attracted these Black Panamanians to Austin, Texas, to Samuel Houston College or Tillerson College, or when the two universities merged into Samuel Houston in 1952, what could it have been? So I had to kind of start, I started to trace, and I had to go back, back, back into history. And what you're looking at on the screen is probably what Panama is most famous for, which is the Panama Canal. You know, people come to Panama, they think the Panama Canal is just a set of locks, but no, the Panama Canal, what you're seeing here, this was all land, just like you see here, this was land. But what was constructed was an actual canal that people dug out, listen, dug out, like you see these men here doing, dug out basically with their hands, their blood, sweat, and tears to build the canal that the world wanted, that the United States finished, but the French started. That had always been an idea from colonial times from when the Spanish arrived on accident, because they didn't discover anything, when they arrived on accident to this side of the world, they always thought about Panama that, in a way that being a cross point because it's only 50 miles wide. But how were they gonna get this done? They needed the labor to do it. And they relied on mostly black West Indians. That means there was were people from Jamaica, from Barbados, from Trinidad, from the French Caribbean Martinique because England abolished slavery in the 1830s. That 30 years before the United States, 20 years before Latin, many Latin American countries did. And there was a lot of labor, a lot of people that were looking for opportunities and many of them came to Panama. In the construction, over 200,000 black people went to Panama, including many people from the United States. The first world the first famous boxing, Latin boxing champion, this is Panama Al Brown. His father was a formerly enslaved man from Tennessee who moved to Panama, married his mother from Martinique, and he was born in Colón, Panama, and he became what we call Latin America's first world championship, the uh, first world boxer. But and I always start to question, like, what does that mean? How were these people? Because these people received so much negative treatment in Panama. They were English speakers when they should have been Spanish speakers. They were Protestants because they had relationship with the British colonial system instead of Catholics, like the Latin or like the Spanish were. Right, so they encountered a lot of discrimination and the nation only relied on them in very limited ways. So how does this, how does this connect to Houston Tillerson? You gotta understand, Samuel Houston College and Tillerson College were two separate entities. Founded around the same time, not founded, founded around the same time, the late 1870s and early 1880s, which is the same time the construction of the Panama Canal was going on and many other projects stemmed by the United States and other European imperialists and black people were on the move. Even in the United States, African-Americans were being liberated from enslavement looking for opportunities. So historically black colleges and universities start to emerge, right? And Houston Tillerson, or I say they were two separate institutions that come to, into Austin and they're, on, they're in this. As people are moving, they're also bringing in black people from different spaces around the country, around the state, but around the region and around the world. And that's a part of our culture as historically black colleges that many people don't know or recognize. And I really, I really love this book by Frank Garrity called Forging Diaspora. And I definitely recommend you to get it. But he traces how 
Booker T. Washington, who founded the Tuskegee Institute in 1881, was being contacted by a lot of Black Cubans, Black Puerto Ricans, Black this, this, and that, to attend the university to access opportunities they couldn't access at home. They were unable to go to school in Cuba because they were Black. Even though Cuba didn't have the Jim Crow, or Panama didn't have the Jim Crow de jure racist policies, there were many large barriers that prevented Black people from accessing social mobility in the country because of their race. But it was confused. But the United States at these historically Black colleges and universities provided those who had the means, like Cyril Powell, like these individuals, like my father and my, and my uncles and my aunts and family, to travel to the US to be able to access education in very specific Black spots. Um, and I put Dr. Reuben Shannon Lovingood, who's Samuel Houston's first, first president, who in the archive that I found with Danielle, they will refer to him as Booker T of the Southwest, because this is the Southwest of the United States. And I, and I have to put two and two together. I'm like, if Booker T is doing this in the Southeast, and they call it Loving Good Booker T of the Southwest, and I'm trying to figure out why is it that Panamanians are coming to Austin? Maybe there's a connection there. Maybe these HT has been a diasporic site, just like Houston Tillerson, just like Howard, just like all these other places that have afforded that allow black people the opportunity from whatever nation they came from to seek an education to hopefully improve their life, hopefully improve their life. And, and, and it's important to note because in all this movement that's happening in Latin America between the English speaking Caribbean, people are parents are from Jamaica, somebody's parents are from Barbados, they're born in Panama, they're raised in Panama, they're raised somewhere else. All these people are in so much communication to the point you see the Panamanian national team in the 1940s, all of these members, even though they're representing Panama, are none of them are running at a collegiate level in Panama. It's impossible. They all have to leave. See, even this woman here, Carlos Bousset, he goes to Xavier, a black college in New Orleans. Sam LaBeach, he goes to Morgan State, a black college in Baltimore. He's a Hall of Fame. Cyrilo McSween, he's a character in himself who we definitely should know. He goes to a predominantly white college, U University of Illinois, Urbana Champaign. He's an Olympian. Frank Prince, Savannah State, a black college in Georgia, in their Hall of Fame. Lloyd LaBeach, a Panamanian, Hall of Fame, the first Panamanian to win gold, two medals in the Olympics. He went to UCLA in Wisconsin, a PWI. Charlotte Gooden went to Tuskegee in the university. So, it's a lot of connections that these people are making because of their history, because of their history. And they're able to form relationships around the region. They're multicultural, right? Their parents might be from Barbados. Their parents, they might have one parent from Panama. So they can speak Spanish. They can speak English. You know, my dad didn't learn to speak English in the United States. He spoke English from Panama. He spoke both languages because he has ancestry in Jamaica, in Barbados, and he has Panam Black Panamanian uh, ancestry as well. So he always spoke both languages. So he was in this network that had already started to form in the late 1800s when Black people were on the move to bring all of our Western nations into modernity. When we think about globalization now, we should credit that to Black people from the US South and the Caribbean. We the ones in the globe, we bring this, the whole Gulf Coast, the Caribbean Sea, we're the ones that allow any of these nations to claim modernity because we literally construct them into modernity. The canals, the railroads, the bananas, the sugar plantations, the cotton farms in the Jim Crow South that are the sharecropping system. We bring all of these people into all these nations into modernity. And Houston Tillerson isn't left out that aren't left out, again, thanks to Danielle, I've been able to go through the archives and really find Panamanians. And I, and I, and you know, I like to play a game, find a Latino, right? Since we love talking about like these, <laughs> it's so different. Okay, in these pictures, there's a couple, where's the Latino? So there's a couple Latinos, if you will, in these pictures. I want everybody to identify which one is the Latinos. Which one, who are they? Where are they, <laughs> who are they? And these are all athletic teams at, the, at, at Houston Tillerson, 
starting in the early 1950s. But don't play. I don't worry. Randolph Barber from Panama on the tennis team. Archais Petit from Panama on the tennis team. Clifford McPherson from Panama on the basketball team. Uh, Mr. Bonick on the track team from Panama. Mr. Martinez from Panama on the track team. And there, you know, it's so many people. And, I don't, and those are the only people who I know are w that are from Panama. But who's to say that these other people don't have diverse backgrounds either? And, this, and the, the days are very important here. 1954, 1959. These are only who I've been able to identify so far. But I am convinced that there's a larger link that I just haven't found yet. So you, we have to think that these people came, entered Austin as people from Latin America, who we will be calling Latinos today or Afro-Latinos, but had very black experiences. Because many of these people, including Mr. McPherson and Mr. Petit, started to work in the school districts. Mr. McPherson worked at Old Anderson High School, which was only for, well, majority for black people. Not Latins, not Latinos, but black people. Even though it was a different system, it's where he was situated when he came to Austin. I'm gonna have a couple more minutes and I'll finish. And you know, but they set the stage because they came in the 50s. This is a very important time. They set the stage for people like my dad and his brothers and sisters to come. This is my dad. This is the night, this is 69. They're in Panama. You know, they're they're dreaming about having a good life. This is my dad. This is his sister. She comes to HT as well to play tennis and basketball. This is his brother, Victor, who represents Panama in, in the Junior Olympics in the 64. This is him before he goes to Florida to play in the Davis Cup with, his, with my grandmother, his mother, his aunt, and, my, and, my, and his sister, my aunt. So they're already preparing themselves for what comes next in their lives. And because so many Panamans have done like they did, well, did what they wanted to do and left and went to these places, Houston Tillerson was one of those same sites. Because my dad, he talks about, he was like, you know, we understood more or less what kind of locale we wanted to go to. He said, they asked us if we wanted to go to Georgia. He was like, no, I heard about Georgia. I ain't going there. Oh, no, 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 no. I heard about Georgia. How about racism? He decided, okay, well, let's try Houston Tillerson. This gentleman, Stanley Lonely, he was around in those, in the, the older picture that I showed you. He was a contemporary. He was one of Panama's best track athletes as well. So he maintained a lot of these connections diasporically, beyond nation, beyond language, to provide these Panamanians an opportunity to have access to a dignified life. I argue that they wouldn't have been able to do what they did in their life without going to Panama, um, without leaving Panama as black people from where they are. But the last thing I'll say here in close is when they came, of course, they had challenges for not being African-American. But of course they did. There was differences. We have to understand that. But also, we have to understand that they've always been here. This is my dad when he, pledged, when he crossed Alpha in 1975 at Houston Tillerson. You know, this is his graduation. This is my mother, where he met her on Rosewood Park. And there, this is a Panamanian woman here. So they entered into the society, into the United States, and because of Houston Tillerson, I argue, or whatever institution they go to, they start becoming productive members of our society, most times among African Americans. Many people that I met when I was in high school or middle school, they were like, oh, you Panamanian? Oh, you black. I remember my Spanish teacher, Mr. Green, at Pierce. He was a Panamanian. He was supposed to man. Oh, Mr. Wallace, the black Spanish speaking man. Yes. Right? So they entered and largely have always been associated with these communities in ways that they have never, in ways sometimes that I, that I think are, are oftentimes not song, seen. And I'll end by this, because I'm a UT student. These are important dates. University of Texas. It doesn't integrate undergrad students until 1956. But I've already shown you from 1942, 1954, there were already black people on Houston Tillerson's campus, which shouldn't be a surprise. But when we think about Latinidad, I'm a student at the University of Texas at Austin. I study in the College of Education, and the name of our building is George Sanchez. 
very prominent Mexican American, received his master's degree in 1931 from Houston, to, I mean, from the University of Texas at Austin. The first Mexican American to graduate from the University of Texas at Austin was in 1894. So when they tell me you're Latino, I'm like, well, what, what was the difference between these Latinos that came from Panama, that spoke Spanish and had to go to HT versus these ones who could enter UT whenever they wanted to from the beginning? So who are we really talking about when we say this stuff about Latino? And I think Austin is the, one of the best places to really break down this idea of Latinidad and who belongs, who doesn't, and what does it mean, and what does it mean. Thank you all for listening. I'm open for questions. Woo! Thank you so much, Javier. Yeah. So if you have any questions, you can enter them into the chat. But just to kind of follow up on where you left off, um, could you go into describing um, or how would you describe Afro-Latinidad and, and what does that mean? And I know that there's a lot of talk about that term right now in who's included, who's not included. So could you share more on that? Hmm. Hey. And, you know, and the best, briefest, because we have several questions. So, um, you know, just yeah, okay, cool. go for it. I'm going to be cool. I'm going to be cool and be in brief. Oh, you know, I think, Afro-Latinidad, as we understand it today, is something that, like the comment, like, oh, that's Dash. It's a myth. Um, it, 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 it doesn't, it means something. It does mean, Latinidad does mean something. I think Latinidad, Latinx, is very racialized. And it's racialized in a very brown way. And it doesn't mean black at all. And I think even when we have to say Afro-Latino, Afro-Latinidad, in language that I use and have used a lot, has to really understand where is it coming from? Because kind of like everything I just said is, you know, when this language didn't exist, how did they have to identify themselves? And I'm not saying, should they not have been proud to be Panamanian, proud to do this? But I also understand that to speak Spanish for many of people in my family, has been one of colonization beyond just the conquest in 1492. That to be able to be a Panamanian meant to speak Spanish, to be a Costa Rican and leave beyond the borders of Limon where many Afro-Caribbean people meant it was prohibited until 1948. So I think our Latinidad needs to really check itself in all of the white supremacy laden within it and who gets to claim it, why they get to claim it, and exactly they need to understand who they're excluding when they use that language. Because many of us, we know, you know, it ain't no joke. I mean, we just talked, I just talked about it from 1874 to 1978, you know, so <laughs> that's a hundred years we've been doing. Yeah. So can you go a little bit deeper into talking about, you know, anti-Blackness in Latin America and in the Latinx community and, you know, the kind of relationship there? Yeah, it, it's, it's rampant. I mean, it's just like the United States. Um, I, I, I recently saw something on a presentation that Dash did, who's on the call, who's the co-founder of Afro-Latino Travel, from a news article that said, you know, the bullet that kills there is the same bullet that kills here. And it was made in reference to what's going on in the United States, but made by Black people in Latin America that are finding solidarity within the movements that are happening in the United States. And also saying that we are in this too, even though our nations have tried tooth and nail to make everybody think that we don't exist or that we have happily mixed in into the general populace, that's not true. Because the same way that they stereotype and profile you for being black is the same way that they stereotype and profile us for being black in whatever way that, that we wanna name it. So I think the way that it manifests itself in everyday life is very anti-Black in the region. And that means like police stops, profiling, you know, mind your business and being stopped to the institutional level. You know, the way our governments are structured, the way our, our, our the way we live are excluded from mainstream society, excluded from the infrastructure. Displacement is something big that African, that Black people are dealing with 
just like African-Americans are dealing with gentrification in urban cities in the United States, I think it's very relatable to the Garifuna, people in Central America who are being displaced from their historical land to build, bodily to build tourism, to, to build tourism on um, hotels and stuff. It's the same thing that I think that many Black Colombians that, that go through this violent displacement because the state is now invested in their land and what they can gain from it. And I think, you know, it's very similar. And I think white supremacy is fluid. Y eso se habla, eso habla español también. Cogieron el español, just like they spoke in English, French, Dutch, you name it. What Shirley said, you name it. You name it. So um, with, with that being said, in terms of what your research is about and just shining light on um, like Panamanian at athletes, how do you, what do you hope to get? Well, can you share a little bit more about that, about what your research is about and what do you hope to accomplish or achieve with um, sharing your research? Yeah, most definitely. Um, my research is about something that I've labeled basketball trafficking, which is human trafficking in U.S. high school basketball among international youth, um, particularly those from the global south, people might use developing countries um, as a terminology to locate the places that I'm talking about. So I, I, I want to highlight how this exploitation happens in the United States using the F1 student visa. So I look at it at a very macro level, like this is how it happens, right? Student wants to come to the United States, they get a visa, they come, something happens, the, some, the visa becomes voided and they might have find themselves in a very precarious situation with an unstable migratory status. But then I also look at trafficking and exploitation, particularly black Panamanian athletes, historically, just like what I just talked about and, and trace the decisions that these young people make in 2017, in 2019, in 2020, versus all of the historical decisions people of their ancestry have had to make. Why do they still feel like I need to leave Panama to have a shot at a dignified life? Because I feel like that's a decision that my father had to contest with in the 1970s when he finished high school, is what happens to me in my trajectory of life if I stay? And what happens to me if I leave? Will my life, is the perception of a better life to that? And I think those are the same decisions that his great grandfather and great grandmother made when they were leaving Jamaica and Barbados. What happens to me if I stay on this island and the sugar industry is no longer providing any type of substance for my life? What does it mean for me to stay? So I look at, that historical decision-making process rooted in anti-blackness and exploitation at the core, I'm asking the young person who I follow in my dissertation, did his exploitation begin in the United States when he found himself in a bad situation or is his exploitation a long product of the exploitation of black bodies in disregard from when he's in Panama? Because he's of West Indian descent and he's of colonial descent. Like all of the people that I talked about who perished in the construction of the Panama Canal, all of the enslaved people who perished when they were doing when they were doing any type of work for the benefit of the country, where only their bodies were of value and not their persons. So those are the that's the deep question that I'm asking. I want to highlight the macro problems that are going on at the structural level with the visa process, but also that these decisions that many of these young people are making are rooted and anti-blackness, racism, that people have, like them, have always been making. And this is just a new manifestation as we enter into a billion dollar industry of basketball in the United States, which we know can't be good. People who feel marginalized, exploited, and people who feel like they can make billions. Something gonna happen, bad stuff is bound to happen, is destined to happen. Mm -hmm. So do you think that, you know, once you finish here and you know doing your work here in the states that you would want to go to live full time in Panama to continue to um in, improve upon this work or do you think that 
you would kind of spread this word here, you know, in in this particular country? Well, you know, I feel a lot like my father, and I feel a lot like the young person who I follow in my in my ethnography. Of course, not like them because I wasn't born in Panama, and Panama wasn't the only citizenship that I had. So there's many things that are different. But, you know, I decided to live in Panama full time and start life there. But then I also understood that for me to reach the level where I want to reach and make sure that this message is able to be shared and be credible, I had to leave. I had to go. I had to leave Panama because it wasn't the place that would allow me the opportunity to be able to reach this level for all of the reasons that I've mentioned previously. So as I now finish, come to an end, and now have to do something with this work, it does become challenging to think about what is next. The desire is to be in Panama, but it's, again, the question that I've been asking, what can I do in the country? Like, what opportunities do I have as a Black Panamanian, a Black Panamanian, to ascend in our society, to spread the message? But I know my work is always connected to the country, and in some way, I have to be there because there's so many young people who I believe are like the young person in my dissertation, but many that are still grappling with these situ with these, not everybody's thinking about leaving, by the way, not everybody. But there's so many things that are going on that because of the position that I'm in, because of the way history worked itself out in my life, I'm in an opportunity to hopefully do something about it. And at this point, I don't know where that will lead me. I don't know if that's here in the US, Texas, in Europe, or in, in Latin and in Spanish speaking America, the Caribbean, but I, I have to find a way to maintain myself vested in the country and the lives of the young people who are like mine and making sure they have an opportunity. And I don't know where that is. Okay, we have a question from Harry Horsley. She says, um, why do you feel like this idea to immigrate to the US is still very prominent for black people in, the Latin, in Latin America? And that she's still asking this question of her own family in Costa Rica and the idea of what success in America and in in that parallels between Latin America and the United States? A dignified life. I, that's as, as simple as I can say, a dignified life. Costa Rica, Limon. I know Harry, so a uh, little context there. Uh, <laughs> but Costa Rica, Limon, like I said, is a place where, you know, many, like Panama, many, Afro-Caribbean workers migrated to in search of a better opportunity that they couldn't find at home. And they went into a place that was anti-Black, that found that had, was very strategic in erasing its colonial Black population to the point their, their patron saint, they tried to morinizar, to turn into an indigenous person who was originally Black. Um, so I think, you know, Costa Rica became home to a lot of people but I don't think, it's not in his home. And I think a lot of people deal with this. It's not, do I want to stay? I think the question is, can I stay? Not do I want to, because I, you know, it's hard to migrate. It's hard to leave your whole community, your network and people that you live with. That's why we have a lot of people in this country, in the United States, who have unstable migratory statuses and who will not leave because of the network and it's not like, I, I, I don't want to go back there. Or I, it's like, can I? And what is at risk by staying? So I think the, that that's a large thing, you know, from Costa Rica as a, as a Black young person from Limon. You know, I think they ask the question to themselves is like, what does my future look like here? If it, like Limon is like Panama, where between 19, 19 and 24 year olds in, in Colón, 54% of 19 to 24 year olds are unemployed and have no prospects of legitimate work, you know, but I love where I'm from, but my home cannot allow me, doesn't afford me the opportunity to stay. So many people, even in the Costa Rican context, before they make a large, a, a big migratory move to the United States, usually it's very regional first, from Limón to San Jose, 
from Columbia, Panama City to see if I can get a little bit more capital, social and, ec and economic capital to see if, if I can hopefully mitigate the have to go. But if I do, you know, it is. And, and that's what they were doing. Like in the 70s, like you go to Brooklyn, you know, a lot of Costa Ricans are in Brooklyn, like a lot of Panamanians. And most of them are of Afro-Caribbean descent because that was the thing to do in the 60s, in the 70s, was to leave and stay home and do what? You know, talk to who? You know, so I think that's, that's a big thing that people still deal with today. Is like, what, what is here for me if I stay? What can I do at home? Versus what do I, what do I, what do I perceive I can do in the United States? <laughs> because that's a whole other conversation. What I perceive I can do. That doesn't mean it's going to work out the way you want it to work out when you come to the U.S. That doesn't mean that. Because that's a large thing that a lot of immigrants to the United States soon find out when they come in, especially black immigrants that come to the United States, especially black immigrants of the working class. Sometimes it's not what you expected. But you're here, so you make a, you have to find a way to make a way. Okay, so thank you. And I wanna just take this time, if anybody else has any questions, you can um, ask it at this point. If we don't have any more questions, um, Javier, I want you to just think about if there's anything else that you would like to share as it relates to um, Houston Tillotson's history and its relationship with um, uh, Afro-Latino students or um, or and or just, you know, however you want to end this conversation related to um, your roots, your history, uh, what you would like to share with this group of people, um, to the extended community that will see this later. Um, and so before you answer that question is, how do you personally identify? Um, as a black man. <laughs> with okay let me be let me be complete i identify as a black man uh okay. with with u.s citizenship and panamanian citizenship in a time like these when borders matter um and, and nation matters it's definitely important that i identify that i am a black man cisgender black man who has citizenship in two locales because of how hard it is to be spatially mobile in this world, even though some people are forced to do it. So I can move in and out. I'm not, I'm not tied to the Panamanian state or tied to the US um, in any particular way, but I know my histories are interconnected beyond the borders of one particular nation state. But again, in this time, if we haven't been paying attention to what's going around us and the rhetoric around migration, borders matter and I have to make sure I acknowledge that I have the ability to be spatially mobile holding on to citizenships. You want me to answer the next, the last, your other question? Yeah, I would say go ahead and just transition into, um, we're gonna go ahead and just try to transition out. Um, and so I'm also gonna um, leave a link for you all to um, complete a survey um, on this particular event. But as we close out, um, Javier, any closing thoughts um, about what you would like to share? Most, most, most definitely. Uh, most definitely. I think Houston Tillerson, HT, as I mentioned in the beginning, is a central spot for us to definitely start understanding who we are as a city, um, as a people in this part of the United States here in Austin. Like, we can't talk about the Black experience without talking about Houston Tillerson University and the institution that it was before it became Houston Tillerson as we know it today, because of the amount of opportunities for upper social mobility and community uplift that were generated out of Houston Tillerson University for this region. And I think, again, when we talk about Latinidad as the conversation we're having now, I honestly feel that there's no better spot in this country to start this conversation. Why? Because we have, this used to be Mexico that has a long history of African race-based enslavement, people in Texas and Texas, you know, my mom's side, we're a part of that trafficking that came to the state under Mexican sanctioned jurisdiction. And, and you know, we are a part of its history. And we always have had a large, diverse, let me be clear, a large, diverse Mexican 
community in Austin, diverse. And when I say diverse, I mean those who are who are white, those who we call them mestizo, and those who are indigenous, those who are black, those who are so. I think this is one of the best places to start this conversation because we have flattened the conversation so much with Latinidad to mean brown. And since Texas, we think of as a brown state because of the, 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 the actual numbers, but understanding that there's always been black people here in this state, in this city, that have different ties to different parts of the world, there's no better place, I argue, to see this happening. You might not be able to see this in Mississippi, in Georgia, in, in, in many parts of Florida, where we have a lot of other, in North Carolina, Virginia, where we have a lot of HBCUs as well. I think this is a good spot to have a diasporic communication, diasporic conversation in many ways because of HT. And I really would love for people to better understand that, visit Houston Tillerson University, make appointments to visit the archives, find ways to volunteer and donate their time to help the archives be able to grow so that this information is accessible. Because, you know, without me having the commitment or the conviction to bring this out, you know, this is a part of Austin's history that we won't know. You know, we'll continue to say like, you know, the University of Texas had Mexican Americans in 1894 without recognizing that black students of any nationality or ethnic origin were not allowed until 1956. But at the same time, right now across the highway, this institution has always had these people coming through their doors and educating them. So I think it asks, what we have to, it, HT is the nuance that we need. Is the, I mean, I'm a UT student. So if I'm talking, I'm talking bad about UT in a, in a very sick way. We need to have a better conversation with Houston Tillis. And especially now in the conversation we're having about Latinx and these things, the University of Texas at Austin needs to get themselves down to HT, get in those archives in, a, in the least colonizing way possible to be able to understand themselves way better. And I think HT is who we are as a city. It's who we are as a city. It's who we are as a city. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. So I do want to take this time to thank you, Javier, for committing this hour to um, sharing more about what you're researching, about your culture, and um, about its current events. And also for all of you all who have participated in this um, webinar or this conversation for today. And if you do um, want to, right now the, the archives is, the, the library facility itself is, is closed to the public, but if you do have any archival uh, inquiries, you can always email me at dmcgee at htu.edu. And I'll put that in the chat. If you have any um, archival questions that you know, we can assist with uh, virtually. And um, again, thank you so much for uh, spending your this hour with us. And if there are no other questions, I will um, enter my information in the chat and we uh, will go ahead and um, adjourn this, this um, afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us, Danielle. Thank you for everybody who joins. If you want more information, please follow us at Afro Latino Travel. You can find all the logs there. We have amazing classes that are going on to educate people about Black history in Latin America in the diaspora. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, HT. I didn't graduate, don't have it on my diploma. I'm a proud fam Ewan Rattler, but shout out to HT. Shout out. Right, and everybody who came, thank y'all for coming through and supporting. Appreciate every single one of y'all for the support. Thank you. Okay, have a good one. Bye. Right. Thank you.